using gel electrophoresis to separate DNA pieces by size, but not just to get a look at them, instead as a way to purify them. So I'm actually going to, after I take a look, extract them out of the gel. Um, so you cut around the band, you look, take a look so you can see where the bands of interest are. Um, so it should be separated from the other stuff you're trying to remove it from. Um, and then you cut out the band and you can actually like get it, extra, crush it up, um, add some buffer, freeze it, thaw it, and voila, you have um, purified DNA. Also works for RNA um, with the crush and soak method. Um, so let's talk about it. So we can use gel electrophoresis in order to separate molecules based on their size. And a lot of times we're doing this just to get a look at those molecules. So if we can separate DNA or RNA, say, um, using some sort of agarose or polyacrylamide gel, we'll get into these. And then we can use various dyes in order to visualize them, such as fluorescent dyes. Um, this allows us to get a look at them. Um, and so we can do things like tell how the purity and how many products there are and the relative size based on how they travel next to a size marker ladder. But what if we actually want to use those fragments that we just separated? Um, and so a, we can actually do this using, if we extract them from the gel and a way that we can extract them from the gel is this classical like crush and soak method that I'm gonna go into more detail. There are also other methods um, such as electroelution, um, which is a way you can use electricity to help get the band out of the gel. Um, there's also some like kit-based methods for agarose gels in particular, we'll get more into the details, but we can use agarose gels to separate like longer fragments, typically of DNA, um, also of RNA. These, because agarose is, it's, you can actually like melt this gel. And so you can use heat to help you like melt the gel and get the fragments out. So it can be easier. Um, and then kit-based methods um, often have you heat them and that sort of thing. But when we're talking about these polyacrylamide gels, these polyacrylamide gels are really good for separating smaller fragments of DNA or RNA. And they're a tighter mesh and this tighter mesh makes them good for separating these smaller fragments. But this mesh is made by this actual like acrylic, um, polymerization. So with an agarose gel, you're kind of just like knitting yarn. Um, basically, you have these long strands of these sugary molecules that then kind of like fold themselves up into this nice mesh. Um, and this mesh filled with liquid, and we, so we call this a gel, which is like this mesh filled with liquid, and this mesh is going to be useful for separating the molecules. Um, but this mesh is basically just formed by these attractions between the molecules. It's actually these strands aren't like physically cross-linked together. So this is going to mean that when you heat this up really hot, you're able to melt it apart. When you have a polyacrylamide gel, so PAGE that stands for polyacrylamide gel electroporesis, and the polyacrylamide, you actually have, you actually, when you make these gels, so you can either make them yourself, and I have posts on how to do that, or you can buy them pre-made, but they're actually polymerized. They have these different acrylamide units are actually like linked to one another directly through these strong covalent bonds, which means that you can't just melt it easily. Um, so you can't just remove that gel around the around your DNA or RNAs easily, um, but you can move your DNA or RNA out of the gel. And so this is what we talk about when we're like extracting the DNA or the RNA from the gel or eluding it or getting it to come out. And so electroelution uses like electricity to help get it out. And this classic crush and soak method is just going to use diffusion. So basically just let them wander out. So let's look in a little more detail. So first of all, what's happening when we run one of these gels? What's happening is we're going to be separating the fragments based on their size. And this is true for no matter what type of gel you do, even if you were doing say like an SDS page gel to separate proteins by size. Um, so this gel mesh, um, that what the mesh is made of is going to depend on the type of gel. So it's going to be agarose in the case of an agarose gel, it's going to be, um, 
polyacrylamide in the case of polyacrylamide gel. There are different types of gels you can do too. So you can do like a denaturing gel. So like a urea page gel, that's going to keep like single strand, your DNA or RNA single stranded and remove any of the shapes. So RNAs like to like fold up into nice shapes which can alter how they run through the gel. So you often use a urea page gel to keep those strands denatured, to keep them unfolded um, and get them to travel according to their linear length. Um, so because DNA and RNA have this negatively charged backbone, a negatively charged backbone is going to propel them towards the positive charge that you create when you turn on the electricity in this box and create this electric gradient. So that gradient, um, you have the basic charge, you have a charge at the bottom or um, at the end, if you have a horizontal gel, like an agarose gel, um, and these page gels are typically horizontal. And so you'll have your positive charge here, you'll have your positive charge here. And what's gonna happen is that your negatively charged molecules are going to be, um, seduced towards the end of that gel um, because opposite charges attract and but they're going to get tangled up along the way in this gel mesh and the longer pieces are going to get tangled more and so they're going to travel more slowly and so when you turn off the power they're not going to have moved as far and so when you turn off the power you're going to have these pieces of DNA or RNA that are trapped inside of your gel so they're trapped they're like trapped because there's like this gel mesh, um, but they're not like physically stuck in there. And so before they're not, they're not gonna be moving like straight down like they were before. They're not gonna be moving as fast as they were before because you don't have that electrochemical gradient. But if you were just to leave the gel in some liquid, they can, those strands can like randomly wander out um, and if the more liquid you have outside of that gel, the more, the more stuff there is outside, like if it wanders out, it's much, much less likely to come back in if you have a lot of other space to explore out there. And so this is just like the basic idea of just like diffusion is that these molecules are just gonna be randomly moving around. Um, and then the more stuff there is to, for them to move around in, like there's more space. Um, and so they're less likely to come back inside and it's also harder to get back inside because it's a gel, as opposed to just this free liquid that they're traveling around in. And so we can use diffusion to our benefit in order to get this um, these bands to come out of the gel. Um, so when we turn off the power, they're gonna be kind of stuck and not completely stuck. And so this is why you don't want to just like leave your gel sitting for a long time because they can kind of diffuse around a little bit. Uh, but typically that's just gonna give you a little bit of a fuzzy band when you look at it. But you can actually do it to diffuse all the way out. Um, and if you get it to diffuse all the way out, you wanna make sure that it's by itself, right? And so we're gonna be cutting out the bands containing the fragment of your of interest before you do whatever sort of evolution um, or crushing, soaking, whatever method you're using, you're gonna first isolate the band. And in order to isolate the band, you need to be able to see that band. Um, so there are different ways to be able to visualize it. These often use some sort of fluorescent dye. You can also use UV shadowing, which basically just relies on the natural um, UV absorption of DNA and RNA in order to help you see it. Um, and these, there are special like um, plates that can be used for this sort of thing. Um, if you have a DNA gel, you can often, there are like loading buffers, like easy vision, um, dye that you can use to preload with your samples. Um, in the case of these RNA gels, I, or and these DNA gels, these page gels, what I typically use um, is, sorry, let me find it. I typically use this like cyber gold stain. So when you have your gel, it's going to be, it might be small, it might be big, um, but you're going to need to soak it if you're using one of these stains that you soak in afterwards, you're gonna to need to soak it in that buffer. These gels are gonna be really, really fragile. They're gonna be really thin. You don't want to rip them. And you don't wanna rip them when you're cutting them either. Um, and so it's especially important in these cases because you want to make sure that you're keeping the gel intact so that you can then cut it out precisely how you want it and not have any contaminating pieces and not lose your pieces and all of this various things. So, what I like to do, what my colleague taught me, is you can actually like stick a piece of saran wrap 
um, stick your gel, like take your gel out of the cassette or whatever onto a piece of saran wrap and then put the dye on top of it. So this dye is to be like a 10,000 times concentrate. Um, you can make little aliquots of it so you don't have to keep freeze thawing it. Um, add like five, so you would make like five microliter aliquots, add five microliters to 50 mils of your buffer. It's like the same buffer that you ran it in. Um, and then you want to um, let it soak for like five to 10 to 15 minutes, depending. Um, it's pretty fast um, and keep it like shielded in like foil so that you don't have, um, because it's fluorescent, you don't want to like burn out all those fluorescents, um, get them overexcited. They're light sensitive. Um, and so you let it soak and then you can visualize it. So you can visualize it. There are different ways to visualize it. Um, on the gel doc, these are good if you want to just, um, I like to take like a picture that you can like save the picture um, and various things. Um, and then, but in order to cut it, you might um, typically, we, we have a different tray that we use for this. Um, a note is that when you're using their when you're using a UV tray, so there are like blue light trays and stuff as well. But when you're using one of these UV trays, you want to make sure that you're minimizing the exposure to the ultraviolet light, both to the DNA or the RNA in the gel, as well as in your skin. And so you want to take precautions. You use like plastic shielding, um, like thick plexiglass shielding and stuff, and keep that light on as little as possible. Because even if you've protected yourself, the DNA of the RNA in the gel is still subject to having these um, UV introducing these like artifacts that can actually hurt the DNA or the RNA. Um, and so you don't want to expose it to light too much. There are different strategies that people have in order to like locate or, or to mark where they want to cut or to just cut it while the light is on. But you want to visualize the places that you want to cut out and then cut out the pieces using um, fresh scal razors or scalpels. Um, and so, oh yeah, so I just transfer directly. I take that saran wrap. You can actually image it on the image or in on here. Just like take it pull out the saran wrap that you were um, washing it in, just make sure you drain off the stain. Um, and then you can transfer it directly in this way. You don't have to worry about having ripped it. Um, and then you cut out your band. It's really important that you cut out the bands, um, avoid too much gel around it. Um, this gel is going, because that's what we're trying to get it out of, remember? So we don't wanna have like excess gel and that can also interfere with downstream stuff. Um, and you also don't want to cut it any, into any of the contaminating bands. So we're doing this to purify, remember, we don't want to then combine it back with whatever we just separated it from. So it's important to like look after you cut um, and make sure you really cut out what everything that you meant to, um, as well as then just like take a picture for your notes. Okay, so now it's in the gel, now we need to get it out of the gel. Um, so you take this little slice and you stick it into a, into like a microcentrifuge tube. Um, now you're going to want to crush it. This is going to increase the surface area, which makes it, there are more places that it's easier for diffusion because these molecules, now there's more opportunities where if they randomly move a little this way, now they're outside of the gel rather than they randomly move a little this way, now they're a little farther into the gel. Um, and so this is going to give them more opportunities to escape. So you can just take like a P1000 tip, so one of those big pipette tips, and like crush it well against the wall of the gel. Just make sure you're not getting um, it like stuck in the pipette tip or on the side of the pipette tip and stuff. So you're not losing your yield. You just want to make sure that you're, you save all of the stuff that you crush. Um, and then you're going to add extraction buffer to that crust gel. Um, and so depending on the size of your fragments and stuff like that, um, there's like three to six weight volumes or whatever. So just look at the protocols. Um, and this is typically like a, some sort of pH buffer, maybe a sodium acetate, maybe um, something like that, maybe Tris, um, some salts, NACL, EDTA to prevent the um, nucleases that need metal from chewing up your DNA, your RNA, et cetera, um, and maybe SDS um, for like urea page shells and stuff. This is, um, you then are going to freeze and thaw. When you freeze and thaw, basically what this is going to do is it's going to form these ice crystals, which are then going to break. So this is like the opposite of, this is what we don't want to happen when we add cryoprotect 
which is why we, when we're like freezing a protein or something, which is why we add cryoprotectants because we don't want water, water expands when it, um, when it solidifies, when it forms a crystal, when it freezes. And so the solidification, then this can cause like our proteins and stuff to like crack, but we want our gel to crack. Um, and so freezing and thawing is going to help us with this, help us break up the gel. Um, so it should really be like a 30 minutes on dry ice, we'll freeze it nice. Um, and then wait for diffusion uh, following Frick's Fix Law. So Fix Law basically just says that the really the diffusion is going to depend on the differences in concentrations so between like inside of our gel and outside of our gel, as well as like the distance and various stuff like that. Basic idea is it's going to take a while. So typically I do this like overnight in one of those little like mutator shaker thing in my box. Um, because this is just like this random process where these fragments are moving around, moving out. So I'm kind of paranoid about the tubes like leaking out. So I like to put um, parafilm around the tops. And also with this like rotator, it kind of stresses me out <laughs> how it like goes like all so far away. So in like, instead of just putting them like in the little tube holder, I actually like put them tape them on sideways so that it's rotating this way more than like all the way over the lid. Um, it's just, I mean, like it's probably not necessary, but it makes me happy. So I tape them on <laughs> is basically what I was gonna say. Okay, and so then what you're going to do is you need to isolate those, isolate the liquid from the gel pieces. So we want to remove all of those gel pieces and there are a couple of different ways to do this. The way I use is you have these little, these little columns with this little membrane um, that's going to basically capture all of those agarose pieces but let all the liquid stuff through. Um, so it's really like a cellulose acetate a membrane are the ones that I use. Um, 0.2 or 0.4 micron, because I can't find the 0.2 microns, they're like a back ordered. Um, but basically you want to remove all of those bits and get the liquid through. If you don't have those um, little filter tubes, you can take your tube and use a needle to poke a hole in it and then put it in another tube and then spin it like that, as opposed to spinning it in one of these um, specialized things. But the basic idea is you just want to make sure that you're removing your liquid from all of those bits, but you're not, but you're keeping all of the liquid. Um, because overall, these extraction methods are only like, I thought something between like 30 and 80% effective or, or efficient or in like recovery. Um, so basically, you want to make sure that you're recovering as much as much as possible. Um, but you don't want to have those agarose bits or those polyacrylamide bits that can interfere with stuff. Um, then what you're going to do is you have that liquid and now you have a lot of liquid because you used a lot of liquid in order to get that like helpful volume to help you with infusion because the more volume you have, the bigger the difference in concentration, like the bigger the amounts or whatever inside and outside and differences between inside and outside and the more places, like if it wanders out, it's more likely to keep wandering around out there than going in the gel if you have a lot more out there to explore randomly. So that volume is really helpful there, but we probably don't want to keep our DNA or RNA that diluted. We don't want it in that much volume. And so now we can do just like a typical nucleic acid precipitation, like I talked about in last week or the week before, where basically you add a salt. The salt is going to bind to the negatively charged backbone, the same backbone that was helpful for um, getting our DNA or RNA to move through the gel is also helping keep it soluble in the aqueous or water-based solution. Um, this is because water likes those negative charges to hang out with. And so the salt, we need the cation or the positively charged part of the salt is going to hang out instead with the backbone. It's is going to neutralize it. Now, now it doesn't have what water likes to hang out with. And so your DNA or your RNA is going to help precipitate is going to precipitate. But in order to find that backbone, you need to kind of get rid of, remove some of the water, make it easier for the salts to find the backbones. And you can do this by adding something with a lower dielectric constant. So something that's less polar, that has less of the um, like positive and negative charts. 
charges. So even water is like really polar, it has these partial positive parts, the hydrogen and the partially negative part, the oxygen, um, ethanol or isopropanol, they have more of these hydrocarbon parts, which are nonpolar, and it, it, they still have that polar part, so they can still keep um, more waterish like, um, but you, so they can keep something soluble, but not the DNA or the RNA. And so this is going to, when it's in complex with these metal ions. So basically this is going to help those cations bind the backbones and neutralize them. And this is going to cause it to precipitate out. And you can add like a co-precipitant, um, like, like a blue, it has this nice blue dye that's going to help you um, visualize your pellets, visualize the precipitated DNA or RNA. It's just like a dye bound to glycogen, which is this um, um, like sugary storage thing um, that's going to basically just kind of add mass to the stuff that precipitates, but it's not gonna interfere with other things. Um, and so then basically you let it precipitate, then you can spin it um, down to collect all of that precipitated stuff. And then you wash it. So you remove the liquid that was on it and you wash it with like 70 to 80% ethanol. Like this is going to remove the excess salt. Um, and then you spin it again and then you remove that wash um, and then you can dry it and then resolubilize it. So we um, dissolve it again by itself in whatever liquid you wanted. And then you can check the purity um, based on like UV absorption and you can check the purity and concentration with something like a nanofrap. Okay, so hope that helped explain um, gel extraction using this crush and soak method. And again, this is, if you're doing an agarose gel extraction, um, there are typically easier methods you can use, uh, but with the page extraction, because that gel is harder to, harder to like, get rid of or get your stuff out of it's a tighter mesh it's a you can't just melt it um this crush and soak method is still widely used um although electroevolution is another alternative um another thing is that the time it'll take is going to depend in part on the size of your fragments so bigger fragments are going to take longer to get out because they're more, more tangled in that mesh um and so look to protocols and stuff that will tell you more about the various sizes and what you should use and expect in volumes and all of that good stuff. Um, but hopefully this helps you um, and good luck.